What gets you started with the story? Is it the character, the setting, or a mood or idea? Or? Character is certainly important, although I am wary of anything that starts to read too much like old-fashioned characterization. I like I like fiction that acknowledges its inability to supplant reality. So I begin with a character in the sense that I begin with someone I want to spend a lot of time with. <laughs> uh, with someone who has either a certain kind of brain that reverberates with my brain or someone who is interesting and and for whom I can find a kind of aesthetic solution as I flesh him or her out. So I do begin with a character. Uh, yes, I begin with a character. I realize now that you ask. <laughs> and, and do you know when you start writing where the story will take you? Or? Yes, to a degree, maybe 70% of the way. Or rather, I know where the story will take me, but I don't know where I will stop telling it to the reader, if that makes sense. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so how do you work? Do you edit that out or rewrite it as you go along? I, I rewrite constantly. I have tried to, I've tried to be one of these people who can sit down and write a thousand words a day or even 500 words a day. But when I'm so focused on the quota, I am miserable. It's, it's too upsetting to return to it the next day and be unhappy with it. So instead, I've, I've switched. <laughs> I've allowed myself to uh, labor over a sentence until I am happy with it and then continue because then I feel that I have more solid footing in what I'm doing. Uh, on a larger scale, in terms of the scope of an entire story, I, I write the story that I have in mind. I write as far as I want to in the trajectory and sometimes I discover that stopping at a certain point is better than continuing and coloring in the rest of the trajectory for the reader. That's happened. Uh, that happened with my first novel and I, I, I can see how it might be possible with the one I'm working on now. Do you sit down? Uh, what are your daily routines? Do you sit down at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock and then work at a, at, a, at a studio or office? I have a new routine now that I have a, a, a child. We live in an apartment in the center of Milan and because of my daughter, I've rented a, a studio around the corner. So I have a separate space, which is really, uh, it's wonderful. <laughs> um, and there I don't have the internet. And this is also wonderful. I start to work as early as I can. And, and ideally, the, the aspiration is to work for four or five hours, again, with no access to the internet, just uh, my computer or often I begin by handwriting in a notebook or just on a piece of paper in order to get started with a paragraph. If the voice is very difficult to achieve, if I'm finding that I feel rusty <laughs> or, uh, or in some way that I'm writing in a stale manner, I will start on paper, but then very quickly, as I become more excited about it, I'll switch to the computer. And of course, everything winds up on the computer eventually. So, so that's, that's the ideal working day. And at the end of that time, when I go home, I, I then may continue as I'm doing other things, cooking, cleaning, I may continue. I almost always continue thinking about it. And sometimes I do some reading uh, of the news or other books or other materials around what I'm working on. So I'm really always working in a sense, but the actual physical sitting down at a desk is, is, is constrained to, to a very specific period now that I have a child. <laughs> what do you have in this uh, studio or office? Do you have uh, books or pictures? Or? Very little because I like a Spartan space. I like feeling uh, 
for better or for worse, I like feeling in control of my, of my surroundings. So it's very spare. I, I work on uh, a big piece of wood that is on two uh, A-frame stands. And I have some books, books related to my work, research that I'm doing. Uh, I have some maps of, of Milan and photos of Milan a hundred years ago alongside photos of Milan today because what I'm working on now concerns the city and I, I often lie down when I'm working if I need, if I, if, if I find, if I sense that the change in position will help. <laughs> so, uh, so I also have a sofa and, and there happens to be a bed in this space, but I usually work at the desk. Lie down, you, you, so, so that's when sort of like writer's block or is it just thinking? Or? I don't ever get writer's block in, in the, as I understand it. As I understand it, writer's block is when you, you don't even know what to write about. I never feel that. I always have uh, an infinitude of things I would like to be writing about. If I get blocked, it is, it is when I feel that it's not going well, that what I'm trying to communicate is stuck, that I haven't found the right voice or angle, perspective, tone in which to tell it. And so lying down, I have found, is actually a way of detaining myself. <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm comfortable, I'm lying down, it's less likely that I'm going to get up and walk away from the work. I don't do that that often, and of course, if you don't have the internet and you don't, and you're not even working at home, there's really not much else you can do. But I find that lying down, it it draws me even more inward. It 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 really centers me and quiets me in a way that allows me to do nothing but think. You mentioned this this voice, the tone of voice that you're searching for. How 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 do you create that voice? Is is it by handwriting, listening to music, tapping your I don't listen to anything while I'm working. I love music and I listen to it almost all the time when I'm not physically sitting down working, but I can't concentrate as I listen to music. And, and also I think for many writers, I, I imagine this is the case, there's a rhythm to what you're writing and if that's competing with the rhythm of, a, of music, then it's, it's difficult to hear the rhythm of your own work. So when I'm trying to search for a tone, I often fall back on other writers. I, I read books that I've loved to look for solutions as to how I can frame what I'm doing or, or for a tone. For example, a tone that combines poignancy and humor, but also uh, not too much sentimentality. If you can find that in another writer, and then try to write in the same way, and then you make it your own later. <laughs> so it's not, it's not stealing, it's, it's, it's taking the encouragement of someone who's already done it, and, and, then, and then inevitably it becomes your own later as you go over it and over it. And as I said, I revise a thousand times. I have been over every sentence in anything that I have published, I have been over every sentence so many times. <laughs> I am very rigorous, perhaps to a fault. Often writers uh, say that they are not able to, to read other, read fiction by others while writing their own stuff. But, mm -hmm. but you, you feel that it's, it helps you. I used to find that reading contemporary writers was too frightening. It was too daunting. They, they seem like competition. I've evolved <laughs> to, to feel uh, more mature about this. And when I say competition, I, I just, I mean, in a healthy way, you, you compete in the sense that you're conversing with other people. But when they're contemporary, when they're peers, it's, it's frightening. You have to not think about other people finishing things when you are not near finished. However, I, I do really like reading fiction written a long time ago when I'm working. I like reading uh, books that were written a long time ago and, and becoming in conversation with them, answering to them, sort of writing 
back to those writers, writing sort of back in time to those writers, and again, then finding a way to make it my own and make it feel fresh and new and contemporary. But again, I want to say that I have evolved in terms of reading peers, uh, finishing something, publishing something, I find makes it easier to feel a bit more comfortable with the fact that other people are finishing and, <laughs> and publishing things as well. I dare say many people feel this way. And um, in a way, it's why one must retreat from the public world of writing and publishing and editing in order to produce something. Because if you're preoccupied with that, again, with other people uh, progressing, it can be scary. It can be scary. Could, could you give us an example of, of which, which books, uh, what books you were in conversation with while writing, yes. for instance, the New York parts in this yes, book? Yes, yes. Yeah? Uh, two writers come to mind, John Updike. I love his style. I love the, uh, the, the vivid quality of his sentences, but also the joy in his sentences. They remind me of something that E.B. White wrote in an, in an introduction to Charlotte's Web, which was a favorite book of mine as a child. He wrote, all I hope to say in my writing is that I love the world and and I I think that that's what John Updike was up to a lot of the time you really sense in his writing that for all of the catastrophes oh. <laughs> one endures he loved the world he delighted in the world that really comes through and I wanted that kind of levity but but also uh, the profundity of his writing and so I, I looked to him Specifically, I looked to the Maple stories. They're stories that were eventually collected. I think most of them appeared in The New Yorker about this couple, the Maples. I, I read that multiple times while I was working on this book for the style, for the tone, and also for a way of, of telling without, excuse me, showing without telling, which is a bit of a cliche by now. But it is important. You, you sort of have to know whether you, which one you're doing or if you're doing a combination or if you're saying something about, uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you're implicitly rejecting this dichotomy, you sort of have to know where you stand. And for that, I also looked to Madame Bovary, which once I say it, people seem to think this is an obvious comparison, but Flaubert was able to tell you so much about what Emma Bovary was thinking why she was making the decision she was making without without saying Emma thought this Emma was it you know by what she notices you know by what's as much by what's left out as by what is explained to you and so I studied that book along with a book called The Perpetual Orgy by Mario Vargas Llosa which is about Flaubert and the writing of Madame Bovary those were my Those were my texts. <laughs> what, what, what came first, uh, reading or writing? When did you start reading, for instance? When I was a child, I read always. I read like I breathed. I, I just loved books. I used them, of course, for companionship. I used them in order to be inconspicuous, <laughs> which for some reason felt to me important. Um, I... I spent a lot of time at the library, which was right down the street. I do not come from a bookish home. I, I just loved reading. I read, I read everything I could. I had very little direction from other people. Of course, when I got to be in, in junior high and high school, I was told what to read by teachers as part of my courses. But I, I would go to the library and I would read whatever I could find that interested me. Some of it I probably should not have been reading. <laughs> But even that's part of your formation, your education. So I, I loved reading. I never imagined I could be a writer. For a long time, the dream was to be the kind of singer who sits on a piano in a glittery dress. <laughs> um, that was much more appealing to me. And it seemed actually more possible to me. But, um, and indeed, I, I studied art history at college. I didn't study literature. But then I found myself working for a literary agency in order to pay the bills after I graduated. And there I met real writers and becoming friends with them, getting to know them, 
coming to understand their rhythms, how they work, made me think maybe I can do this, or at least that it was worth trying. Uh, did you get did you get any advice from these writers as to how what's the best piece of advice advice you've gotten? I've ha I've received advice in the form of example working very hard, showing up every day, even when you don't feel like it. It is a job like any other job. Obviously, there are many ways in which it's not like other jobs, but it is a job in that you have to do it, even when you don't feel like it, or it doesn't get done, or at least that's the case for me. But I also received explicit advice from a writer who said, uh, who, who recommended writing as though in secret, as though no one will ever read what you're writing and I understood that to mean in order to strip away the ego and also self-consciousness in order to I understood it to mean write with a generosity toward the reader and don't worry about what people are going to think about you <laughs> obviously when you write you hope that what you write will survive you and that means it will survive your insecurities which are not going to matter to anyone 50 years from now so if we are so lucky as to produce a work that people will be reading 50 years from now, you might as well sacrifice yourself in a way, sacrifice the idea that people may have of you, the idea of you that you hope people will have. It just isn't important. What's important is what is going to wind up between the covers. And so you, you, you put everything into that, into being generous, into giving the reader something that that is really enjoyable and or uh, thought-provoking and or illuminating about the world. Another piece of advice that I think is excellent was actually given to me by an agent friend. He said, write the book you want to read. And it's very, it's very useful to combine these two pieces of advice because if you write as though in secret, it risks becoming very self-indulgent. You risk only trying to entertain yourself <laughs> or writing something that's easy to write but not actually all that interesting to read. Whereas if you combine it with write the book you want to read, for me that, that, that required so much rigor, so much uh, self-interrogation. I I am very choosy about what I read now because there's only so much time that we have. And as a, 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 a friend of my husband's family said a, a few years ago, something I've always, I, I think of all the time now, she said, the more you read, the more you realize how little you've read. And so I, I go at it with, with an aggressive breakneck <laughs> um, enthusiasm now reading but I have to be very choosy about it because there's just so much that I want to read. It, um, talking about writing, um, how much is, is talent and how much is hard work, do you think? I don't know, it, it's very personal. Uh, for me, I think so much of it is, is hard work. <laughs> um, I, I, I work a lot, I like working, so, I might as well do it. Uh, certainly, I think a, a degree of talent is very useful. I think if you grew up reading, a lot of, a lot of your ability to write comes from that. It, you, there are, it, it is, I, I feel very confident of this. All of the reading that I did from a very young age, it, it burned patterns of language into my brain. It, 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 it imprinted rhythms on my brain. Something else that has been very useful to me has been living in another country that has a different language. It's almost, it's, it's uh, exponentially expanded my vocabulary in the sense that I am so much more aware of the Latin roots of things. I'm aware of, of words more precisely. We're getting away from the question you asked, but <laughs> Um, for example, the word for consistency in Italian is coerenza, which, which is essentially coherence. But to my mind, coherence and consistency are different. 
and and when I think about it, it becomes difficult to explain what the difference is. But I know that there are sentences in which I would choose to use the word consistency over the word coherence or vice versa. And yet in Italian, there isn't, as far as I know, a word that is more precisely for consistency <laughs> as opposed to coherence. So those sorts of things you, you don't, you're not aware of when you work in just one, when you live in just one language, but also everything once I started living in another country and learning its language, everything, be, everything had a duality to it. Everything had at least two names. And it, it sends you back to a kind of childlike state in which you love language, in which you delight in language all the time. You think about things in terms of their nomenclature. This has been very freeing uh, for, for writing. It, 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 it compounds the thesaurus that you walk around with in your, in your brain.